One of the most common ways to improve a chemical reaction is to speed up the reaction, to make it go faster. This is not quite as simple as it sounds. For example, if we're going to constrain ourselves to a particular temperature range, maybe we don't have enough energy, for example, to heat up a reaction for long periods of time, one idea we may have is to slightly alter the structures of the reactants and products so that the reaction goes a little bit faster. This is a common strategy in organic chemistry, for example, where we can add a substituent or group to the reactant that speeds up the reaction, but that changes the structure of our product as well. And for that reason, this does not represent catalysis. We've actually changed the structure of the reactant, and so what we're writing there is a completely different reaction. It's also not catalysis if we introduce something else into the reaction mixture that is changed in the course of the reaction, even if our products B and our reactants A are still the same. This is actually a completely different reaction because R is being transformed into something else in the process. R here is typically called a promoter rather than a catalyst per se because it's actually undergoing chemical change in the process. But this too is not catalysis. Catalysis occurs only when the thing we're adding in, I'll call it C here, C for catalyst, is regenerated at the end of the reaction. So it appears both on the reactant side and on the product side. And you'll often see this written as A goes to B, with the catalyst C over the line kind of implying that this appears both on the reactants and the product side, and therefore it's a catalyst. Catalysts increase the rate of a chemical reaction without themselves being consumed. And this without being consumed piece is really important as we just saw that these examples where we've added something that ends up being consumed, that ends up changing, do not represent catalysis. So let's dig a little deeper now and look at how catalysts actually work to increase reaction rates. We've seen previously that reaction rate is dependent on activation energy. And the primary mechanism by which a catalyst increases reaction rate is by decreasing the activation energy. So for example, in the figure at the bottom of this slide, you can see that in the catalyzed pathway, which we're defining as the left-hand pathway, the activation energy overall is lower than the activation energy in the uncatalyzed pathway on the right. And it's probably worth adding to the catalyzed pathway, the catalyst itself. We don't know its structure, but let's just call it C for now. It's going to appear both on the reactant side and on the product side, the catalyst C, in the catalyst pathway. So all catalysts will lower the activation energy of a reaction relative to an uncatalyzed pathway. This leads to an increase in the value of the rate constant according to the Arrhenius equation, and consequently an increase in the reaction rate even when the concentrations of reactants remain the same, even when the rate law remains the same. However, the rate law does not have to remain the same. The mechanism of the reaction may change considerably. There is no reason why a catalyzed pathway has to proceed by the same number of steps or the same type of elementary steps as an uncatalyzed pathway. And in fact, in the diagram at the bottom of this slide, we can see that the catalyzed pathway is a two-step process. Step one is the slow step, and step two is a quicker step, while the uncatalyzed pathway is a single step process with one transition state going from reactants to products. So the mechanism may change considerably, and the rate law may change owing to a change in the nature of the rate determining step. In fact, the catalyst may appear in the rate law. Very often the catalyst does appear in the rate law because the rate determining transition state, the transition state for that slow step, typically is stabilized or lowered in energy by the catalyst. This is the mechanistic basis of the catalyst speeding up the reaction. Let's look at an example where we identify the catalyst and intermediates and write the overall reaction for this process. Let's start with the overall reaction, which is probably the most straightforward 
thing to identify here. So to find the overall reaction, we need only to add up these individual elementary steps. Let's call them step one and step two, and we can cancel out species that appear both on the reactant side and on the product side with equal stoichiometric coefficients. So what we can see then is that the CLs cancel out. We have a Cl atom here on the left and a Cl atom here on the right. O3 does not cancel out, so I'm going to carry that through. O3 gas is going to appear on the reactant side. Oxygen atom does not cancel out, so that's going to appear here as well. CLO, the CLO species, appears both on the products and on the reactant side, and so those are going to cancel. And on the product side, all we're going to have left are these two O2 molecules here, which I'll group together and just write as 2O2. Next, let's look at the intermediates in this process. An effective method to identify the intermediates is to look at species that are products before reactants. What do I mean by that? Well, an intermediate is something that's generated in the course of a mechanism but consumed before the products are formed. So an intermediate appears in the middle of a mechanism, you can think of it that way, and disappears by the time we get to the products. So anything we find in here that is a product before it serves as a reactant, and importantly it has to do both, it must be produced in one step and consumed in a later step, is an intermediate. We've already identified the two molecules of O2 as the ultimate products of this reaction, so the first place to look is at ClO, which is produced in the first step. Notice in the second step, it serves as a reactant, reacting with the oxygen atom to give chlorine atom and O2. So ClO is a product before it's a reactant. It fits this definition of an intermediate. And so the intermediate in this reaction is ClO. Just as an aside, this should feel intuitive, intuitively right because this is a fairly unstable species. Chlorine may have a full octet, but oxygen is going to have an odd number of electrons, and the overall molecule has an odd number of electrons. It's just kind of a mess overall. That's a fairly unstable molecule, so it makes sense that it should be an intermediate. Finally, let's look at identifying the catalyst in this process. There's no guarantee that there is a catalyst overall, so our first question might be, how do we actually identify the catalyst given a mechanism by itself. Well, here's a clever way to do it that harkens back to the products before reactants idea that we looked at in identifying the intermediates. A catalyst is a reactant before it's a product. It's added to the reaction, so it must react in one of the steps, but it must also be regenerated later so that it can participate in the mechanism again. So here now we're looking for something that serves as a reactant before it serves as a product. If we look on the reactant side of the mechanism, we see that, okay, we've identified ClO as an intermediate, so that's out as a catalyst. O3 we've identified as one of the reactants, and O we've identified as well as one of the overall reactants. So the only species left to look at then is the chlorine atom. And indeed, if we look at the chlorine atom, it's consumed in the first step. It's serving as a reactant here, and it gets transformed to ClO. However, and here's the clever part of the mechanism, chlorine atom is released in the second step, and so we get it back in the second step, and it serves as a product in that step. So chlorine is a reactant before it's a product, therefore it's a catalyst. Notice that the catalyst can be chemically transformed into something else in the course of the mechanism. It becomes a part of ClO in the course of this mechanism. What makes it a catalyst is the fact that it's regenerated at the end of the reaction. One other thing I want to point out here about the catalyst is that it's generated at the end of the mechanism, which means that the same molecule that entered the mechanism in the first step exits the mechanism in the second step. And so that very same molecule, or atom in this case of chlorine, can actually serve as the catalyst again. And we end up with a mechanism that includes a species that just keeps going around and around and around over and over and over again. This is what we call a catalytic cycle. So in addition to speeding up the rate of the reaction, the beauty of a catalyst is that we don't need a full equivalent of it. We don't need one mole 
of chlorine atoms to react with one mole of O3 and one mole of oxygen atoms. We can use what's called a substoichiometric amount. This is just a fancy term for not enough to stoichiometrically consume all of the reactants to make the reaction go to completion without having to worry about the rate slowing down later on because the catalyst is never consumed. Ideally, right, in an ideal world, we could use only one atom of chlorine to catalyze this entire reaction. Of course, the catalyst is going to be sub subject to decomposition and side reactions, so we typically have to use a little bit more than one molecule, but it goes to show you the power of catalysis. A very small amount of a species can catalyze a chemical reaction. Acid and base catalysis are very common, and it doesn't take much often to catalyze chemical reactions using acid or base. We just need enough that we can get the reaction started and that we don't have to worry about catalyst decomposition. And this catalytic cycle, the cyclic mechanism, will take care of the rest.